<laughs> Welcome to the Harvard Graduate School of Education. My name is Victoria Omachi. I'm a master's student in the Education Policy and Analysis Program. It's my singular honor to welcome Your Excellency, diplomats, ambassadors, and distinguished ladies and gentlemen here today to this fireside chat with Dr. Fatima Mother Biu. Dr. Biu is here today with amazing Sierra Leoneans, one of whom is Dr. Yakama Jones. Dr. Jones wears many hats as an economist, a researcher, and an inspiration to many of us. Dr. Jones is the founder of the Yakama Jones Foundation that promotes literacy in Sierra Leone through reading. Dr. Jones, please, welcome and stage. Thank you, Victoria. Um, my First Lady, Your Excellency, Dr. Fatima Madabio, Distinguished Diplomats, Dr. Carola, students, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> About 12 years ago, during field work, in a mining community in Sierra Leone for my PhD, I met a woman who became more than a snack vendor to me. She was smart and protective, and we became friends. Miss Sire, as I came to know her, confided in me one evening that to support her family, she had to take up commercial sex work along with her younger sisters. The revelation came with a small profound, and yet profound gift, snacks for my journey back to Freetown. In the morning, she entrusted me with her story. Often at 14, with an education cut short, Sire's options were limited. She did what she had to do to survive in a society where education for girls was not a priority. We shared not just an age bracket, but a desire for change. I left that morning feeling deeply about my friend, Miss Sire. My own part influenced by my parents, both dedicated civil servants and educationists, could have been starkly different without their investments in my education. Just three years ago, I was here at the Harvard Kennedy School learning from Professor Ricardo Hausmann, Professor Matt Andrews, and other faculty about how to lead economic growth, about how to make decisions on public finance in, in a complex world, and so much more. Today, I'm a project leader and country head of Delivery Associates, a global consulting firm, helping governments and social impact organizations to transform their goals into impactful results for the people they serve. In our work, we also deliver the Harvard Ministerial Leadership Program, a joint initiative of the Cannes School of Public Health, the Kennedy School of Government, and the Graduate School of Education in collaboration with Big Win Philanthropy. Today, I stand before you as a living testament to the belief that even the most entrenched barriers can be dismantled with education. I ask you to envision a world where every girl, regardless of origin, is afforded the same chance. A world where gender biases that still loom large are not just a hurdle to overcome, but a relic of the past. You all here pursuing your dreams, learning at one of the world's best institutions of higher learning, and carving your own paths towards a better future. What if no one invested in your education? What if some traditions, cultures, beliefs, and practices excluded you from accessing spaces like this because you're a female? The stark reality is gender inequality, gender equality remains elusive in our stride towards the sustainable development goals. This truth brings us together just days before the International Women's Day to remind ourselves of the urgency of this year's theme, invest in women, 
accelerate progress. Invest in women, accelerate progress. Let's be clear, we cannot just accelerate on an unstable foundation. It wouldn't work. I built the Yak Jones Foundation as a commitment to reinstating a reading culture in Sierra Leone, underpinning my belief that reading is the foundation for our learning. Likewise, education is the foundation for all positive change. However, achieving positive change at scale and accelerating progress demands collective, consistent, and persistent efforts that amplify voices of the marginalized and ensure that no girl or woman's potential is left untapped. That's the only way we can accelerate progress that would be sustainable. This is why, together with other Sierra Leonean students at Harvard University, I am humbled to be here with the first lady of my country, Sierra Leone. Her Excellency, Dr. Fatima Mada Bio. So, <laughs> we're here to discuss with you and the esteemed faculty how we can be more intentional about gender equity in education, drawing on lessons learned from our government and her personal interventions to promote gender equality and safeguard our women and girls. Women make up almost 50% of the world's population. Does it make sense to underinvest, underutilize, and limit the potential of half of the world's resource? To me, it doesn't. Research has shown that countries that invest in their citizens' education, skills development, health, and economic welfare achieve significant gains in their comprehensive development. However, gendered social biases and norms can negatively impact the level of investment, efficiency in implementation, and the behavioral change needed to accelerate delivery across all these thematic areas. In education and skills development space, early marriage and childbearing force girls to leave school early, limiting their educational opportunities and perpetuating circles, cycles of poverty. Some cultural norms prioritize marriage and domestic roles and undervalue women's education, thus reinforcing gender inequalities. Some gender-based stereotypes promote the belief that certain subjects or careers are more suitable for men and restrict women's access to other resources. Gender social norms and biases in, a, in economic empowerment also res restrict women's access to resources like land and financial services. I cannot even start to talk about the stigma surrounding women's sexual reproductive health and rights. How can we overlook statistics from the World Bank that show that closing education and labor gaps could potentially raise global GDP by an astonishing $30 trillion. We definitely should not overlook UNESCO's report that, the, that universal secondary education completion for girls in sub-Saharan Africa by 2030 could increase per, per capita income by 75% by 2050 and add an extra $5 trillion to the world economy for in the next decade. Really, really stark figures. It's bounded by research and it's real. Well, humans are complex beings. Systems and institutions are not always well functioning. Patriarchy and gendered social biases and norms are entrenched. So it is indeed critical to unlearn, to learn how to be more intentional about gender equity in education. Today, Her Excellency shares, shares her, her insights, experiences, and strategies for tackling this critical issue in Africa and globally. 
I encourage all of us to be more intentional about promoting gender equity in education and beyond. This is a call to be more honest about the realities that women and girls face globally. It is a call to be more innovative about the solutions and being more inclusive with the approaches. It requires a systems approach and continuous efforts to bring more people, especially women, along. This is more than an economic imperative. It is a moral one. Among the many hats I wear, I am an Amuje leader at the Ellen Johnson Sirleaf Presidential Center for Women and Development. Amuje means we're going up, shifting the landscape for our girls and women, and moving from a culture of tokenism to one that genuinely values women, women leaders. It is high time we commit to unwavering advocacy and innovation in gender equity and education. We owe it to every girl who, like Miss Siri, faced uncertainty in the future. We owe it to ourselves and to, the, and to generations to come. For every woman who rises, the world ascends with her. This is the essence of Amuje. All of us must go up. With these words, I encourage you to listen actively, ask questions, and forge personal commitment towards a more equal world, as Dr. Carola Suarez Orozco, professor in residence at the Harvard Graduate School of, of Education, and Maria Mawuri, a gender rights activist, education specialist, and journalist, currently studying an EdM in learning, design, innovation, and technology, converse with our distinguished First Lady. Let's move beyond just acknowledgement to action, ensuring that no more stories like Miss series unfold under our watch. Thank you for lending your ears, minds, and hearts to this vital cause. Together, let's climb the steep hill towards gender equity in education. Let's go up. Good evening, everybody. It's really a pleasure to follow up after those words by a woman who I've looked up to for such a long time, and she knows this. Good evening, Your Excellency, my First Lady, the First Lady of Sierra Leone, Dr. Fatima Madabio. Good evening, Professor Dr. Suarez Orozco, my professor here at, at Hugsy. Good evening, esteemed guests, esteemed faculty of Hugsy, esteemed diplomats from Sierra Leone far and near here today, and my fellow peer Hugsy students. So I, I see a lot of familiar faces here that I've sat in class with, and we've exchanged a lot, so I think a few of you know a few things about me. And um, maybe not everybody knows, but now I want everybody to really know that I am from Sierra Leone. <laughs> I'm from a small country in the coast of West Africa with some of the most hardworking and loving and amazing people. <laughs> and I have worked at the forefront of gender equity in education in Sierra Leone for the past three years before coming here. And so I could go on and on, but I just need you to hear me when I say that working nationally and regionally and internationally in this work, I have not seen more intentional commitment to gender equality in education and gender equity in education as I have seen from our First Lady, and all the efforts being done in Sierra Leone right now. We we'll go. I have left Sierra Leone and been in regional spaces and international spaces 
talking about gender equity in Sierra Le in the world, in education and in the world, and people say, oh, you're from Sierra Leone, they're doing such great things there, and I've heard Sierra Leone's doing this and Sierra Leone's doing that. And so my first question to open up this panel to Her Excellency is, when we're all struggling with understanding this concept, why are you so intentional about girls' education and, or gender equity in education? Why are you and Sierra Leone being so intentional about it right now? Thank you, Mayoma. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, ma'am. It's an honor to be here with you all. I'm very much grateful to have this opportunity to share our own knowledge as to what gender equity means in an African context. I'm very humbled to be here. Um, when we are talking about education, education is the enabler for every human being. It's the equalizer for every human being. It is only through education that no one is better than the other person. And I feel if we had the opportunity to give every human the same equal opportunity in the learning space, enlightenment, and have the same opportunity to excel in education, then we'll have a better space and a better world where everybody will contribute meaningfully in nation building, everybody will contribute meaningfully in a continental and the universe building. The reason why we are having a lot of problems within um, not just Africa, but all around the world, is lack of education. When you're educated, you're exposed. When you're educated, you can make decisions that make sense. When you are not educated, you always take decisions from, from another person's point of view. And for me, that is what is wrong. Because wherever we have um, a situation where we don't have peace, the people that suffer the most are the women and children. It is always the women that are victim in a situation that they don't create themselves. But whatever happens, it is the women and children who suffers. So if the women and children are the ones who suffer, we should be able to give them the opportunity to understand how to protect themselves, to understand how to develop themselves, and to understand how to lead. Because if you don't know how to lead, you should not be a leader. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a compassion, you should not be a leader. And the people who create all the instability within our continent and beyond, I don't think they should be leaders. We should give space to people who have compassion. And I think women do have compassion. No woman will create a situation that will affect their children. And when they make those decisions to destabilize a country or to destabilize a continent, they don't think about the ripple effect. They don't think about how many people it will affect. They don't think about how many people will lost their lives in there. And the reason for that is that when they make those decisions, women are not in that room. And I think we need to open the space. And the only way women can actually sit on the same table is through education. Because they're not going to give us the space freely. We'll have to fight to get there. But with education, you have a weapon. Your weapon will not be God, um, guns. Your weapon will not be bombs. Your weapon will be enlightenment. So where men want to fight, you will use knowledge to let them see that fighting is not a solution. Thank you. Bravo. You have such clarity about the importance of education. And there are so many topics in, in your role as First Lady. There are so many topics and issues you could have taken on. When and how and who inspired you to, to choose this topic? You know, what, what was the root of your inspiration for this? It's not more about inspiration for me. It's about um, going through a situation where I believe if, um, 
for me to protect as many people as possible, I have to also channel my energy on making them understand that education is the way. Mm -hmm. um, you don't become a victim and not remember what happened to you. True. When you're a victim, you always remember your situation. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason why when I do things like this, I do them intentionally mm -hmm. because I am speaking from my heart. Mm -hmm. I know mm -hmm. what the problem is because I was once there. Mm -hmm. I was a victim. Mm -hmm. And uh, being a victim means I'm not speaking from, some, from somebody else's experience. I'm speaking from my own experience. You know, early marriage is a human crime. When a child is forced to be married at a tender age where they cannot make decisions for themselves and a man can have sex with them freely without their consent, it's legalizing rape. So for me, when you are a victim of such a situation, you then see every child, every child in the world, you know that that child needs protection. Because if you don't protect them, the men who actually do these things to young girls, they don't care what happened to the girls. It is, I mean, how long does sex last? Now, that five second or maybe five minutes of your pleasure will destroy a child's life forever. In that situation is one of the reasons why it has been my own life journey to say, as long as I live, I am going to fight and make sure it doesn't happen to young girls because I know what it means to go through something like that. Your clarity and compassion is striking. I'm sure that you encounter many challenges in obstacles in the work that you do. Can you share a little bit about what are some of the, what are the biggest challenges? We can imagine them, but what, you know, what are, so, what are some of the biggest challenges and, 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 and how do you circumvent them? What, you know, what have been some of the strategies that you've used to, to circumvent them? When you believe in the things that you do, you don't allow people to stop you. You just have to believe and don't allow anyone to stop you. For me, in fact, my biggest challenges in the space I found myself at the moment are women. Even though you are fighting for a woman's cause, you have women that will just hate you for no reason. And they will be the one fighting you for no reason. You don't have any problem with them. You're not in the same circle. You don't meet in the same nightclub. You're not sharing the same husband. But they don't like you for no reason. And if you ask them, why is it that you don't like this woman? They don't have a reason. They will just say to you, I just don't like her. Envy is an ugly thing. And you know why? Because what you do, they are not able to do it. And because they are not able or not capable, they will use their negativity to slow you down. And for that, I've said to myself, I'm just not going to listen. I mean, for these ladies that are here who are part of Harvard and they're from Sierra Leone, they will tell you, in fact, when you try to demean what I do, we thank God for TikTok, right? I just play music and then dance on TikTok. And that's my answer to you. And that's telling you, I really don't care what you think because you can't stop me. But the most evil part of the whole problem is that perpetrators, they don't allow you to succeed. When you fight evil, evil fights back and they fight with vengeance. If you are not focused, you are not dedicated and you are not intentional, you will never succeed in your mission. So, before you start, be prepared. Be prepared to fight and be prepared to say, you will not stop me. Because they're going to use institution to come after you. They're going to use money. They're going to use bad boys, bad girls. They're going to use social media. For now, 
is the biggest mass destruction. They will use social media to just destroy your name, to make you be or feel so small, to make you stand in front of a mirror and ask. Because they will, they will describe you in a way, even you yourself, you start to believe what they're saying. And what means do they use? Social media. And all of this, you know, at the beginning, it used to affect me. I used to cry. I would go back to my husband and scream, say, I will not take this. And then gradually, I realized that this is a tactics for them to stop me. And whatever you put on social media, at first, if you come on social media, you know, and then you say, um, I don't like the first lady's makeup, you know, Very I'll go back topic. and ask you on the same platform, is it your business? <laughs> and then you will hear this same person who attacked you would have recruited so many other people. They're waiting for you now to say something. And that's when you see them coming. They all come from their holes. And now, oh, this is not the way first lady behave. Oh, God, how did, you, how, how did we find ourselves in a situation like this? How can we have this as a first lady? And if you go and check, check the first person who made comments on you, what you did, Check who her friends are will be the same people who are now criticizing you. It's like they sit and they prepare, they come after you. One person come first and the rest join. So I have learned to say, you know, every year I grow because if you don't grow, then who are you? I have grown to a point where now, even if you insult my mother, I wave to you and smile to you and I walk past. And I believe that is more painful than even saying anything to you. So I've grown into this. When I become first lady, I have no prescription. Nobody told me this is how first lady should behave. Because there is no prescription in the world that tells the first lady, if you used to chew chewing gum when you're a first lady, you should not chew chewing gum. You know? But people expect you to know that, oh, you should not chew chewing gum. Excuse me, what's wrong with chewing chewing gum? When you're first lady, when you go out, you sit, you cross your leg like this. Hello? What if I can't lift my leg? How am I going to cross my leg to look like a first lady? I don't understand. So for me, I'm saying to myself, allow me to be who I am. Do the things that I believe in. Let me use my energy in solving the problems that I can solve rather than you expect me to do what pleases you. Because if I'm not enjoying my work, then I'm not working. Anything you do that you not enjoy doing, there's no point of doing it. When I take the challenge in saying that I'm going to fight for women, I'm going to fight for children, I'm not doing that because it is only the women and children who need help. I'm doing that because they are the vulnerable ones. And somebody has to speak up for them. And that is what I have been doing, continue to speak up for them. And as long as I live, I want to have the opportunity to speak up and pray that this equality that we've craved for since the day they've set up um, the United Nations, they've been talking about gender equality. I think it's well overdue now for us to be equal. So my prayer is that the men will see us not as commodities, but see us as partners. Because when you partner with us, we will do great things together. When a man has a partner at home, that home is a happy home. That home is a peaceful home. But when a man has a liability at home, that home is a sad home. Because which means your wife or your partner will always be a yes ma, yes sir person. And I don't think that's what you're looking for. Especially if you're a student from Harvard. Would you want to have a partner at home who comes to you every morning and asks for food money? I don't think so. And that is possible when you give women the space to thrive. When they do, they do. We multiply. Everything we touch, we can multiply. So give us the opportunity. See us as partner. Don't see us as targets. And let us work. And that's the only way we'll be able to 
actually actualize this gender equality. Us women, we cannot be talking to ourselves because the problem is not us. Anytime you want to talk about gender issues, please make sure the room is full of men. And let us plead to them and say, you are still the superior being because men has ego. Support their ego and tell them, I just want to be your partner. And I tell you, when a man feels special in praising them, they give you space. And when you give me that space and I squeeze in, when I sit, the man knows that they cannot move me back because I have now earned my space and I'm not going anywhere. And that's what I am preaching to say, give us the space and you will not regret it. Will be a very, very productive partner to you. Excellent. It sounds like there were many lessons in there. Uh, one is to have a very clear vision of what you want to accomplish. Another is to dismiss the judges that don't matter. Right. To 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 learn that not every judgment that it, it, people will always be judging you mm -hmm. when you're in a particular role, and some, like the folks on social media, or or in Spanish is a term chismosas, the you know the little gossips. Mm -hmm. uh, you just have to learn to turn that off. Um, and then it, you know the other thing I hear is the the importance of 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 working with partners. Of, um, you know, you, you will never change the minds of people who are completely opposed. And the people who are already on your side, you don't really, you don't need to waste energy on getting them. It's the persuadable middle that you need to work in partnership with. And it sounds like you've been very um, successful at that. Um, and that you had to learn to grow into your role. One doesn't just automatically know how to do what you're doing. Um, can you share with us a little bit about who and where you turn to for models of practice? So, you know, equity work, equity work, gender equity work um, is, is hard work. It, there's a, it's a long battle. It's a uphill battle. Um, and there are there's some models of good work out there, and, and sometimes you just have to create your own work. I'm wondering... You know, wh where have you turned to for counsel, for models of, 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 of practice? And, you know, tell us a little bit about that, if you like. You know, when, when I assumed the office of a first lady, of course, um, it's a new territory for me because uh, being an actress, I own my space mm -hmm. and I choose the people that will come into my space. When you're a first lady, you are now people's property. Mm -hmm. So that's a difficult thing where as a first lady, um, I'm answerable to people. As an actress, I am not answerable to anyone. I can come as late as possible. Mm -hmm. I am the star. You have to wait for me. But as a first lady, when you're there to serve your people, you don't have those attitude at all because the way people feel about you has to be very, 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 very important to you. So um, the journey has been a bit difficult, but the one person, I have a relationship with my husband which is totally different from an African um, on prescription of marriage. My husband is not just my husband, he's my best friend. Mm. So, in most cases, when I found things very difficult, and I don't know, you know, how to navigate or where to, to, to go, I go to him. And I go to him for one reason, because he is not just the president of Sierra Leone, but he is a sympathizer of women. And whenever I speak to him about things that I wanted to do or issues that are bothering me, 
he will have an answer to those problems. One of the reasons for that is that he understands the struggle that women go through. His father died when he was only four years old. So it was his mother and his elder sister who brought him up and he saw the struggle they had to go through just to be able to educate him. He knows the struggle that his mother and sister had to go through to see him through to the military. You know, they've always been there. It has always been a woman in his life who would help him move from this point to the next level. It has always been women. And he understands women's struggle. So most of the policies that he had changed in favor of women, most of the things that he has done in favor of women is his own life journey. And he keeps saying, what my mother went through, I will not be here and allow another woman go through that. What my sister went through, I will not be a president and not change that narrative in favor of women. So it's easy to go to someone like that and talk about women issue and then he understand exactly what you want and what should be done and help you get to the level where you want to be. In an African context also, not every first lady had the opportunity that I have. Not every first lady is given the space to do the things that I'm able to do. Not every first lady is given that opportunity to change lives and touch lives because we are not voted for. Everybody expects that it is the president who should be doing this work. So when the president now hand over, women are, you, the largest population in Africa are women. For any country, it's the women who are the majority. So when a president says to you, I want you to focus on just the women and the children, then you know there is a huge trust between the two of you because within that space, anything that you do and it didn't work, it affects the president directly. Anything that you do and it backfires, it affects his political credential. So, but because we have that kind of partnership where we could talk about every issue and make decisions together, we will sit and say, we do A, we do B, and he will say, no, let's do it this way. We do it this way or do it that way. So it has always been a partnership between the two of us. Mm -hmm. When we want to launch, for example, when we wanted to launch the free sanitary pad, I knew that's a taboo subject in the country. Men will not talk about menstruation. I can bet even men in Harvard here don't talk about menstruation. Do we? Do we talk about menstruation? Do, so, you see, because menstruation is a very difficult subject. And I knew that. And this is a civilized world where everybody believes that, you know, it's the, the world that is liberated and everybody can say or do anything. But there are certain subjects that is a no-go area. Now, to get my husband to be the one to launch sanitary pad, that's, that's, that's like... I don't think it's priceless mm -hmm. because he will have to stand there. He will have to actually explain the effect of menstruation on women. What people will not understand is he's talking about his wife. Mm -hmm. What I go through when I see my menstruation, the pains that I go through, what he needs to do to get me through those few days. And that's how he was able, without naming me, he was able to launch the sanitary pad for our girls, which has helped so many girls in Sierra Leone today because it has kept them in school. They are able to be in school. They are not missing any day from school anymore. They can come to school and be comfortable. So that partnership that I have with my husband is always my go back to person. I'll go back to him and, and ask. Of course, I, I mean... 
um, when you talk about role model, my role model, people will tend to go and look for role model on TV. I cannot have a role model that I don't speak to. So my role model has always been my mother because I can go back to her and then explain my problem, and she's there. She'll be able to advise me. And when I go to school and I ask people about their role model and they start to tell me about Julia Roberts, and, uh, you know, I said, that person don't know who you are. We need to have a clear definition what a role model is. A role model is somebody who would help change your life. You know, it's not someone you watch in movies. A movie is a film, and that's a character of somebody playing a bigger character, so you believe in them, but that's not the person. So my role model is my mother. Mm -hmm. My go-to person is my husband, mm -hmm. because there are things that I will talk to my husband, and I will not tell my mother, of course. because there is a line also that um, mm -hmm. I have with my mother that I don't cross. With my husband, I can cross all the lines. <laughs> well, you've you've shared an extraordinary partnership that has is clearly at at the root of a very success uh, uh, of, of your, the successes that you have brought about so far, and that I imagine will continue over the years. If you were doing this, you know, I want to back up and say I was listening to you say, well, in an African context. The first lady, it's we're not elected. Mm -hmm. I was thinking, well, in the Latin American context, in a U.S. context, in European context, in every context, mm -hmm. the first lady, frankly, in most cases, is just a ceremonial. Yeah, it's ceremonial. Mm -hmm. They and they often ha have very little influence or impact. Mm -hmm. Very little. Uh, so, all the more power. <laughs> To what you have accomplished, and 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 if you were particularly given the topic, that, the topics that you've taken on, if your husband wasn't aligned in in vision, mm. I think it would be very difficult. Of course. So that the two of you together are working, and you are the ultimate ambassador. You have grace, you have presence, you have intelligence, you have you have uh, education, you have all of that, passion. <laughs> Uh, and that makes for, you know, for not moving that boulder up the, you know, the Sisyphusian um, mountain. So, um, you know, that's, that is, it's, it's striking. And I, I'm also, as a psychologist, I always look to the roots of people's motivations. Both of you have a family story or a life story that is at the bottom of the, the kernel, of, you know, of the, of, of the work that you do. Uh, that gives you empathy. You have extraordinary empathy. Uh, for you're not doing it for yourself. You 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 understand the pain that so many folks are have, and you are going to make the world a better place. So thank you. Thank you, Mom. Thank you both so much. I've been sitting here listening just in awe, and I've learned so much. And I believe we all have learned so much today. We are almost at time. And we want to give some of the audience members a chance to ask Her Excellency any questions regarding how to become more equal-minded um, when we do the work that we do. And to open it up, I'll ask one last question to Her Excellency. If you were to give us one piece of advice, one quick line, all of us sitting here are going to go on to be educators, politicians, some of us are already leaders in education, and we're all working to build the best education sectors that we can in our corner, in our community, in our countries. What is one piece of advice you would give my fellow peers here studying education, education policy and design at the Harvard Graduate School of Education as to how they can build education systems or sectors or classrooms that are truly filled with people who are, is it equity-minded? Is that the term we were talking about with Carola? Um, and who believe in gender equity in education. One piece of advice that we can go away with tonight. What I will say to everyone is, you will have to define what success means to you. If you know what success means to you, then you know your journey. 
you have a dream. You don't allow anybody to kill your dream. But for me, success means how many lives I'm able to change. It's not how much money I have in a bank account. So if you are able to define what success means to you, how many lives are you willing to touch? When you finish from this place, what are the differences that you're willing to do? What are the sacrifices that you're willing to sacrifice to make other people's lives better? That is through humanity. And through humanity, you will be able not only to change the world, but you'll be making a difference. And you will not only be blessed by God, but the people's life that you are going to change, they will remember you forever. And you yourself, at your old age, you will sit and be proud of your achievement. And that is when you now count success. And that is when you now understand that education has helped you to make this difference to the world. And education is what you use to actually change the lives of too many people. For me, that would be my advice to you. Let your dream and desire not only be measured about on how much money you have made, it should be measured by how many lives you have managed to touch and change and help. Thank you so much, Her Excellency. I think we have time for two or three questions. We've got a question over there. Thank you, Her Excellency, for your time. It's such an honor that you are here. One quick question. Um, if you had the opportunity to give another piece of advice for all the first ladies in the world, what would be? I would tell them to take their, their title seriously. Mm. We are not voted for, but when your husband failed, it affects you and affects your generation. When your husband is successful, he protects your children, and then you'll be remembered. You can't hold a position and not serve your people. So I, I normally say this to people. When they voted for my husband, it's buy one, get one free. <laughs> so if you're a first lady, you cannot only focus on the glamour side of being a first lady. You should be able to serve your people and serve them well. Your Excellency, yes, um, I got this mic and I didn't even know what to say again. <laughs> um, thank you for taking our time to be here and uh, inspiring us. My name is Uchenna, I'm from Nigeria and I have uh, 12 years experience with uh, STEM education. So I'm very passionate. So as you're sitting here, I've already Googled Sierra Leone and what they are doing with STEM education. Mm. And uh, I want to know, um, the micro level of uh, education matters to me because I come from that place where I shouldn't come to Harvard. Like, I didn't know how I, I got here, but I knew I have the willpower. Mm. To me, I want to bring African children. They might not get here, but I want to look back and take them. And it's from the micro level, from that point where you have smart and intelligent girls, but they wouldn't have a chance except someone stretch out their hands and help them. So on the micro level, I would like to know, I know that your work is so tedious, but on the micro level, is there something you are doing to, to reach out to this um, young, beautiful girls that may not have hope? In Sierra Leone today, I can assure you, every girl has hope. Yeah. And uh, when it comes to what you're talking about, it's for the very first time in our history since independent that our president has introduced every girl who is doing STEM subjects they are now, their fees are being paid for from pre-primary school to primary to secondary to university. 
And when you get to university, your, your, your result will actually determine whether you are a child that's supposed to be in a place like Harvard. Look at the women that we have in Harvard today. They are from Sierra Leone. And there's too many of them who have come through this institution and today they are serving our people. And I think, you know, with the introduction of the free fee for young girls, we now have more girls in university. We have more girls. The girls are leading in all public examination in Sierra Leone today. You know, for the very first time today in uh, Sierra Leone, our girls are topping, they are shining, and they don't have to worry about anything called fees. Before now, there's a choice for a mother to decide on which child to go to school. And it has always been the boy who they will, they will prioritize to go to school. But they don't have that problem anymore. We have free quality education being paid for. 22% of our national GDP is now spent on education so that every child, boy and girl, will have the same quality education that will be an enabler to actually be an equal partner in nation building. So for us, we are working, and I hope Nigeria will follow suit. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank you, uh, His Excellency. Um, thank you for that um, brilliant presentation. Actually, I'm also from Nigeria, and uh, um, I think the issue about um, gender equality is a little sensitive in the sense that when we look at the cultural background of Africa, mm. according as in Nigeria, you no, know, it is believed that the head is always the, the man. Now, and um, the, the, the advocate or the preach of uh, this um, gender equality, I think it has resulted to so many uh, diverse uh, issues in the family. So how are you trying to marry the gender equality with the family issue that is actually uh, uh, um, happening now today. Thank you. That, that is why I'm having a conversation with people like you. <laughs> we will have to. We cannot have this equality if we do not make the men understand that we are not here to take over. We don't want to take over. We know when you go to the Lion Kingdom, you know who is the king. We know you are the king. We only want you to share that space with us so that we'll help you. So you go up. Just come with us. That's all we are asking. When men start to understand that, you know, you don't love a woman just because you're having sex with them. You love the woman because you want them to grow. You love a woman because you want when you sit on that table, you make decisions together. You love a woman because she contributes to what you want in the home. And that woman compliments you and make you a better man. With that, if you start to see us as the person who would make you a better person, you, you better yourself. So when you stand in front of a mirror, you're proud of yourself. You don't see us as liability. You see us as partner. And for that, that's the only equality we're looking for. So when I come home and I say, hello, darling, you will say to me, my love, how are you? <laughs> because, you know, we are partners. Then that's where equality starts. We're looking for partner, partnership. That's all we're looking for. Thank you so, so, so much. I know we have more questions. I know the mic wants to be passed around. I'm so sorry that we are out of time. Um, I, I don't know what to say, I'm overwhelmed. As an African woman, I just feel so happy for that last question and that last answer. <laughs> I just, I, like, I just, the context is great for me. I'm so happy. 
that that happened. Unfortunately, we have to close. Your Excellency, the First Lady of Sierra Leone, Dr. Fatima Madabio, thank you so much for being here with us today and bringing a bit of African gender equity to the Harvard Graduate School of Education. We've heard that now it is free for girls to study STEM and STEAM in our country. And so many, so I could list on and on. We've heard about the free sanitary pads in schools in Sierra Leone. And if you want to know more micro-level details and and policies and implementations and programs, I can list them all, come to me. Um, and I think we've just taken a lot of lessons today of just how to think equally and, and be powerful and stand in our power and not take no for an answer when we know we're fighting for justice. Um, so thank you all for coming out tonight. Before we fully, fully close, Victoria, we would like to say an even bigger thank you. There's the three, the third. Okay, so one, two, three. We'd like to say an even bigger thank you. This is from Dean Terry Long, who could not be with us today, unfortunately. The Dean of the Harvard Graduate School of Education would like to present Your Excellency with this gift. Um, it's a lot of Harvard Graduate School of Education branded things because we want you to remember us and remember that you came here. Dean Long, unfortunately, could not make it, but she had... a. Uh, last minute emergency, and as we know. And this as well is for Dr. Jones. Thank you so much. Again, you don't know this, I'm from Sierra Leone. <laughs> and I have been following the work of Dr. Jones for years. She's been my mentor and my role model for years because like many women leading in development in Sierra Leone, she makes herself accessible to young women like me. When I was applying for the Amujai Fellowship, she met with me, she sat with me, she wrote my application with me. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for her. And last but not least, there's one more bag down there. I would not be here. I'm going to get very emotional um, in this part. Last but not least, I would not be here if it was not for another... Sierra Leonean woman who's fought for the rights of girls' education and health in Sierra Leone. I told you I'd get emotional. Um, she put this whole tour together from Hugsy to HKS to HLS. She's worked tirelessly to bring her excellency to Harvard because she knows that standing next to me is a woman whose work has saved the lives of millions of women and children from vulnerable, back vulnerable backgrounds. She's my own sister, my blood sister at the Harvard Chan School of Education. Um, and she's so embarrassed in the corner, like, I'm so embarrassed. Fatu Wuri, we have a little bit of gifts for you from Dean Long as well. This is how we do it at Hugsy. Um, yeah, that's for you. <laughs> So we have to bring the night to a close, but as you know, there's refreshments, a lot, a lot of food and drink outside. But before we do close as well, she's so embarrassed. She's like, why'd you do this? I also really want to thank Professor Dr. Carola Suarez Orozco. <laughs> if you've had any course with Professor Suarez Orozco, who I call Carola, you will know that she is a monument to Hugsy. All of us have our favorite profs at this school. <laughs> she, she is, she's beyond a professor and a monument to me. And um, thank you so much. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for being part of this really important conversation. And with that, we will close this fireside chat. <laughs>